Secrets and the Sufis Question. Why do Sufis hint at secrets and speak of remarkable places and strange books and so on, if not to titillate? The Cultivated Volunteers Answer. When they do so, it may only be to identify the superficialists who scramble for these things. This resembles the old army technique when the sergeant says to recruits, hands up those who are too cultivated for manual work, and then, when some hands go up, says, these are the men who need the most training in manual labour, and assigns them the roughest tasks. Another reason may be that what to you is titillating is to me my everyday life. Words like remarkable, strange and so on have no absolute meaning and are utterly subjective. What is the meaning of secret, strange, remarkable? It is not unknown for Sufis to deal in things which cause people to react in this manner, in order to allow the audience to experience and to observe their own changes of mood and sensation to realise that too many people have too many buttons to be pressed in them, as it were. There is no single answer to the question, yet it is one of the most widely misunderstood because careless students have assumed that Sufi teachings aimed at single individuals or groups or intended for short-term uses are perennial injunctions applicable under all circumstances. Much Sufi literature is no longer applicable since the mentality of the audience has changed over the years. Rumi speaks of the matter of so-called secrets when he says, If you do not see the secrets of truth, laugh at us. Bread for the Hungry Secrets and strange places and remarkable books, too, are often the current coin of the language in which uninstructed people think about certain matters. In order to connect with these people, you may have to use their language at the outset. This does not make it your language. You remember the saying, to a hungry man, two and two means four loaves of bread. If you are speaking to a hungry man, your first words might well be about bread. If you want a shorter answer to the inference that Sufis simply want to titillate, here is an old proverb. If you believe it and think that you are sure of it, know that you are in fact in need of improvement. Being sure and believing are stages to be superseded on the path to certainty. Words like secret, too, are technical terms among the Sufis. A better rendition of secret is often innermost consciousness. When to have meetings Question. People hear about something and immediately crave it, as you have pointed out. Why does just any meeting with a teacher or a source of knowledge not produce results for the student? The Spring of Sweet Water There is a Persian saying from the classical Gulistan of Saadi to this effect. Wherever a spring of sweet water may be, Men, birds and ants will circle around it. Wherever there is a source of attraction, people will surround it in accordance with their nature. I say in accordance with their nature because human beings resemble animals in being attracted to the aspect of things which immediately attracts them. As with animals, sometimes these things are suitable for them, sometimes not. Let me be more specific. You hear about a teaching and what you hear attracts you, or perhaps you want to find out more about it. This means to you that you should with the least delay make a contact with this teaching. The assumption here is that you can benefit from a contact made at your convenience or under circumstances dictated by you. This attitude is unpromising because it does not correspond with what could happen. The only value of a teaching to you and to the teaching itself, is when you become attuned to it, in the way, at the time and under the circumstances which are best suited to a fruitful relationship with that teaching. Even a fish can only drink so much of the sea. 
In this respect, the teaching is more subtle than, say, learning a language. You can get a book, or recordings, or a tutor, and study a language anywhere, at any time, whenever you can conveniently do so. And yet, even with learning a language, conditions must be right. You must be in a certain mental and physical state, not too tired or too hungry, for instance. You must be in a comparatively comfortable place, not standing in the open in a downpour of rain, for example. You must have certain essentials, an electronic machine, electricity, or to be able to read, preferably not be deaf, and so on. The ordinary man can grasp these needs in a learning situation which he organises for himself. He does not so readily bother to think about them in respect to higher knowledge. Why not? Learning how to learn involves examining assumptions. Muller and Nasruddin tales very often fulfil this function. Shabistari on Attunement Shabistari, in his Secret Garden, alludes to the problem of attunement between teacher and learner, and between people and their experiences, emphasising that the harmony must be right. Illumination is sometimes of grandeur and sometimes of beauty. Its perfection is between the two. People crave things, you say, and you are right. But if the thing which they crave, in this case Sufi knowledge, is qualitative and not quantitative, an adjustment to quality must take place before learning can take place. Consider the fact that Sufi teachers give subjects and other materials to students to study so that a result may be seen when it can take place, and not just by an arbitrary 2.30pm the following afternoon. People who are victims of the belief that learning takes place mechanically or by instant illumination cannot profit from this, because they reject a whole range of the interaction between the teacher and themselves. Any meeting with a teacher can produce results, but it is the student who will inhibit these results because of the shallowness of his expectations. We have published numerous tales which illustrate this point on learning how to learn. Question. Is this why you seem to discourage people from coming long distances to see you, while they continue to arrive from the ends of the earth, from Japan, Argentina, India, Canada, Samoa? Answer. I do not discourage all such people, but there is a pattern, and I am glad to be able to share it with you, since it is one which lies at the very root of our studies. When I was a young disciple, I had exactly the same question and was in just the same sort of position as you. My teacher used to get letters and visits from people from all over the world. I asked him why he discouraged people who made, or were prepared to make, long and sometimes difficult journeys. What he told me I have found to be true, and even, if that is possibly, doubly true. It was this. Attitudes of Disciples People tend to think first and mostly of themselves. This can mean that when they hear of our work, they passionately desire to take part in it, to learn more, to benefit themselves personally. When they do this, it always means that they are feeding their own selfishness and have become fixated on personal advantage. On the other hand, when people come into contact with our ideas and spread them to others in the right kind of way, that is, not cultishly or by setting themselves up as teachers. They are sharing as well as taking something in. Such people never clamour, first of all, to be received, seen, taught, and so on. They cultivate a group of people, spread this knowledge as best they can, and then they ask whether they should come or whether someone might visit them. They are, in fact, in a condition to learn and to serve, as well as to be served. This establishes the continuum of serving and being served. Others, on the other hand, spend large amounts of money to travel, collecting it sometimes from others, and think only of themselves, even if they do not realise it. If they do not see this behaviour in themselves, it is for us to point it out to them, so that they can profit from so doing, and learn to readjust their greed by establishing the serve-and-be-served continuum. 
This is what my teacher taught me. He used to say, Many people think I am only testing them when I send them messages to this effect or if I do not answer them, giving me an opportunity to change their approach from give me to what can I do. But you will see in this very place how the people who come here under such conditions turn out to be unteachable, mere metaphysical tourists. He was completely right. So, by refusing to teach, he gave them an opportunity of learning this behavior of their own through self-observation. Some of them, although only a minority, actually learned this. Of course, we would have been able to cut down very much on this difficulty by publishing anecdotes where it had been shown by classical and other teachers how anxiety to learn is sometimes a mask for self-interest. This has enabled quite large numbers of people to adopt a correct posture towards the teaching. Learning how to learn is well illustrated by this kind of approach, and this does show how one and the same person can be unable to profit from the teaching. While he or she insists on extending this greed side of the personality towards it, and how the same person may be able to learn when applying the better and more promising side towards it. But do not forget that there are just as many who do not know how to teach as there are who cannot, in their present state, learn. There is even the circumstance that people who think that they can teach are unconcerned about the learning side. How a language was taught Only the other day I found a delightful example of this mentality when talking to a language teacher. He said, I have a marvellous system all my own. I taught it to a man who enrolled as a private pupil. I taught him absolutely perfectly. I said, in the usual rhetorical way people use in general conversations, So he knows the language very well now, does he? Oh, not a word, said the teacher. I taught him perfectly, but he just would not learn.